English language teaching under the cover. Hello everybody and welcome to English Language Teaching Under the Covers. Uh, I'm Neil Teacher and today I'm along with my esteemed colleague Rich and the great and powerful Patrick Jackson. Welcome to the show, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. How, how nice of you to introduce me in such an inaccurate, inaccurate fashion. Lovely <laughs> to be here on this. Uh, Neil has the, has the best intros. That was good. I, I can do that. <laughs> Especially on a grey, cold, wet Irish morning, you know, you need a pick me up. Yes, yes, I can totally imagine. Uh, you need to uh, shine on. Sorry, I'm using I'm using your own book titles there to, to add to the intro. Everybody up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to begin, uh, what we'd love to be to you is kind of have you tell um, your teaching story. So if you want to um, go all the way back to the beginning um, and see how you became this all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wonderful Patrick Jackson. Well, I was thinking about that the other day, funnily enough, mm -hmm. um, and I've had a very checkered career in teaching uh, and I'm look, I was looking back and I was thinking when was the first time I did any teaching at all and I remember at secondary school there was a kind of a scheme where we could go down the road and, and help uh, the primary school kids, that's elementary school kids um, with their reading and I suppose I was probably about 15 or 16 and I really enjoyed that. Um, so that was the very first time I did any, I suppose you'd call teaching. Um, and then next thing I found myself in Paris and I was just kind of uh, bumming around Europe and I found myself in Paris and somebody said, oh, you can make money teaching English. All you have to do is go to somewhere, where was it? Uh, like the British Council Church or some place or you know, <laughs> American, the American church lobby and put up, there's a notice board there. And if you put up a sign and just put your phone number up and you'll get somebody. So um, this guy got in touch with me. And, and so I used to go to his house and his wife and him used to cook me this fantastic dinner. And, and I used to eat dinner with them. And then at the end of dinner, they would give me like, I don't know, I can't remember how much it was, you know, 100 <laughs> yeah. francs or 50 francs or something. And I'd go home and I was thinking, gosh, this is, this is fantastic. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, um, I've really, you know, I've nailed this uh, backpacking thing. Um, and so that was, you know, my first couple of experiences of, of, of teaching. Uh, and then um, I started, I did all sorts of other things in my 20s, uh, including working on a fishing boat and uh running my own uh, late night restaurant. Wow. And so, I mean, actually, I, I would say that running a restaurant is uh, or being a waiter is an extremely good training for, for being in the classroom. Um, well, so anyway, I had my own aspect of interacting with people. Uh, and, you know, especially if you're working for tips, you're you absolutely need that pleasing <laughs> in the performance. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, if when you look at your classroom of students, and if you imagine these are all customers in my restaurant mm -hmm. um, and my, you know, they've all got their own individual, um, they've all got their own individual tastes and their own individual uh, thing going on. You know, they're all there for, for different reasons, possibly, and you're serving them mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, hopefully delicious uh, uh, morsels for them to, you know, improving <laughs> morsels. Um, uh, in a in a pleasant and uh, you know attractive manner, uh, so yeah, I think that you know there probably is a lot in common. Uh, whatever about the tips, um, and so yeah, and so this Japanese woman w uh, uh, came to my restaurant, and then a few days later, I went to her restaurant. She was working as a waitress in a Japanese restaurant down the road, 
And one thing led to another, uh, and then we got married. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I had enough of running a late night restaurant in Dublin, and she said, why don't we go and live in Japan for a year? So that seemed like a good idea. And so we went to Japan. And like many people, I'm sure many of your, your listeners, uh, having arrived in Japan, I wasn't an engineer or a banker or uh, anything really. Uh -huh. So uh, somebody said, oh, you should teach English. Um, actually, no, that's not, that is not true. Sorry, that's, that's a lie, actually, because I knew I was going to go and teach English and I did a, a very short TEFL course. Mm. And then I went to Japan and then I said, they said, where do you find a job? And they said, you look in the Japan Times Monday edition, it's full of English <coughs> teaching jobs. So I opened the Japan Times Monday edition and it is, or it was, full of English teaching jobs. And there was one which was, which said, potato club, uh, <laughs> It's a potato club needs teachers. <laughs> okay. Well, I come from Ireland. I, I, I guess this is, uh, this is the job for me. Um, so I, I went and I had a, an interview and trial lesson at the potato club where I taught these two, you know, there was two children, small yeah. children there. And I, I was put in the room with them. And, and it was sort of, you know, there was a couple of people watching me. And I can't, you know, I can't remember what I did, but at the end they said, you've got the job, you know, you're just right, you're perfect for us, you know, you're, you're, you're just... Before the then, had you, um, had you dealt with any young learner students? Because you, you talked about being in Paris, and I presume those were adults because they were cooking for you. In Paris, I had one student and it was a, he was, a, he was an engineer or something or a rocket scientist or, or you know, he was, he was my... Uh, yeah, he was just a guy. Yeah, he uh -huh. wasn't a he was he he wasn't this size. You know, he was full grown up. You know, and the, and the the course that you did did that, that touch on uh, teaching kids as well. So my two week TEFL course, as far as I remember, had I as I could be, uh, you know, maligning them, but as far as I remember, it had no relevant content to teaching children. Yeah, that sounds about right. Mm. Yeah. Um, it could be wrong though. It was only two weeks long, so even if it had, it certainly didn't have have a great compendium of. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's just my experience a lot with uh, these these courses. Um, they they often gear towards adults, and then you know, like yourself, and you know, as it's happened with Rich and I, uh, you mm. suddenly get thrown in with the little kids, and you're like, "What? Well, hold on, what was this yeah. in the course?" <laughs> How did this happen? Right, yeah. and, then you, and then you have to do the young learner extension courses or whatever. And it's all, it always seems to be that way around, doesn't it? It's like you do the adults course and then you do the, the YL extension course. And we were saying how these days, you know, maybe there's some arguments to say it should be the other way around. Um, because in, in most sectors, in most uh, countries, it seems like it's the YL sector that's really, you know, that's really big at the moment and really growing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Absolutely, I I hundred percent agree with you, and I hundred percent believe that I, in no uh, sensible and professional world, should I have been allowed to teach children, given my complete lack of training of any sort, and and I think it's a fundamental, you know, and it's a fundamental problem with the with the industry of, or, you know, and and I think. You know, it's not. It mightn't be a popular opinion, mm -hmm. uh, but the fact that there are thousands and thousands of people going into classrooms with children with very rudimentary qualifications, if any, uh, mm -hmm. is not good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've we've talked about this, and at some point we're we're probably going to do a, a deep dive into the whole subject around that because it's it's so weird that we mm. have like back home in the UK and in Canada and Ireland, there's, it, we're so rigid and um, rightly so uh, concerned about having a teacher that's you know, properly qualified, you know, walking into a kid's classroom and yet you can get off a plane in, in many countries and just walk into any classroom to teach English to, you know, little mm. kids <clears throat> with remarkable little you know, in the way of qualifications and, you know. Yeah, and, uh, you know, going back to uh, 
going back to my story, you know, that can equally be traumatizing for the kids as for the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, you know, usually the, ch the teachers are usually adults, so probably able to handle it better than, mm. than children. And, and I mean, I think, you know, there's whatever about the teaching element, there's all sorts of um, safe health and safety and, you know, oh. that kind of uh, issues as well, which, you know, I mean, we, we probably don't want to dwell on it too much mm -hmm. in this interview, but especially as I was a, 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 a full-on uh, sort of, uh, you know, example of this, you know, walking into Japan and literally within a few weeks teaching. And not only that, but being told, oh, you're such a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're so good at this. You're, so, you're just brilliant. Um, which uh, is also very wrong because I didn't have a slightest clue what I was doing. Well, maybe they saw the future potential, you know, well, a diamond that, in the rough. Yeah, great. But yeah, that, that you can tell that to the parents of the children I was teaching for the first five years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. OK, so uh, you're in the potato club. Um, and how did it go from there? Um, well, the potato club was was a well, I had I think they had about maybe four or five hundred students. Uh, it was probably a very typical uh, private uh, English language school. Uh, kids used to come after their regular school, and they were some of them were quite small. Um, yeah, and we had forty minute lessons, um, as far as I remember. It was a nice atmosphere, you know, we were treated well as teachers, there were four or five teachers and, you know, we did five or six hours uh, of teaching each day, usually in the afternoon. So it was, it was a lovely job, you know, it was, I used to have the mornings off. Um, I, I was given some support in creating, you know, being creative with what I was doing and, and I was actually supported by, and that's how I got into sort of I mean, I've always been sort of a scribbler and, and making worksheets and so on. So uh, we started making little books. So, so this is uh, this. I think this is the first. This is the first uh, potato pal book, uh, and it was just uh, you know very simple. And the kids used to color it in, uh, and yeah. Uh, so. That support from um, my boss in the in the potato club got me started on that, and she, and we did loads of them. You know, we had at the supermarket. We had in the this is this, <laughs> this is a shocker. <laughs> this is this is this is bad. You know, <laughs> um, you have potatoes in the kitchen. Are they cooking potatoes? <laughs> They're cooking a potato cake. Oh my god. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll even show you uh, this horror story. So yeah, it's no, done. No. <laughs> uh, we cut the potatoes. You know, we boil the potatoes, etc. And uh, this is the worst. Uh, we mashed. Them. <laughs> and you know, I never thought about it. And and. Uh, when these books were picked up by Oxford University Press, I was like, yeah, we're going to do it in the kitchen as well. Because we did, you know, we sort of versioned a lot of these books. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, we don't think it's really appropriate to have potatoes <laughs> eating other potatoes. I was like, okay. I can imagine the whole ridiculous of that, <laughs> that conversation, that meeting with them. Like, okay, Patrick, uh, are you okay? You have <laughs> you know, potatoes, yeah. eating the potatoes. But that's... Um, uh, there's a fantastic video on your YouTube channel, uh, the dream dream come true, I think, where you talk about the how you came to producing um, the potato pals with uh, the Oxford Press. And I'm, I'll put a link below so you know, people can kind of go there to your YouTube channel and kind of get the full story about how you did it. It's, it's such a fantastic story. Well, it was a pandemic. Uh, it was a pandemic. You know, you know the way when the when everyone was in lockdown, everyone thought, "Okay, I'm going to go make loads of YouTube videos," and uh, it was one of those. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, well, everyone's welcome to. Yeah, uh, so, go go and have a look uh, at secret. the pandemic special <laughs> <laughs> from Patrick Jackson. Uh, it goes deep dives into how Potato Pals came to be with uh, sending off the the brown envelopes 
uh, oh, yeah. to Oxford Press. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's a great story. Um, well, in Ireland, brown envelopes has a different connotation. I don't know about where you come from, but in bra brown envelopes are usually given by politician, uh, by sort of people to local councillors or politicians with cash. Oh, Brian. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so there are no brown envelopes involved in the... Uh... Uh, so, yeah. so from there, um, you send off your brown envelopes to the Oxford Press. They, they pick up those books and... Uh, Boom, the uh, or into to, uh, producing English language teaching materials. Yes, it was very, very lucky, really. Um, and it wasn't until a few years after, actually, it was, I think, about four or five years after. And I'd actually left the Potato Club and uh, moved on to sort of junior high school and high school teaching. And I just showed the little old books to my sister and she said, uh, you should send these to a publisher. So, um, that led on to yeah being a and and then i suddenly found myself as an oxford university press author <laughs> um, <laughs> which which i am always keen to impress on everybody i meet you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, so but actually it was a, a, you know it's an honor and it's a thrill to see your books being you know used all over the world uh, which had bigger publisher is able to facilitate and they um, also uh, got me a potato Patrick, before you um before you uh, were publishing them with oxford um how were you producing them were you using like local print shops or um well these guys were published well, well they were printed around the corner by a local print shop yeah i mean but right. these could have been done on a photocopier actually uh, or nowadays these could have been done on on just any old printer mm -hmm. but th yes there was a guy around the corner and he used to smoke we used to bring these uh, so the drawings i didn't do these drawings obviously um mm -hmm. the dr my classroom assistant so the potato club had a system where the classroom assistant would um would stay in the classroom obviously to make sure that the foreign giant didn't beat up the children or something uh -huh. um, or to change nappies in in that sort of situation um uh so yeah so rie did all the drawings so i used to do rough sketches and and rie did those and then we used to take these lovely beautiful drawings that rie had done around the corner to this printer who used to smoke he used to he used to have a sort of one of the it was like a cartoon cigarette with bits of ash falling he was just ash falling off and he used to brush them sort of off the off the <laughs> um, and uh, but there yeah so i mean i i reckon it any you know i think everybody should be publishing things all the time because all you need now is a is a photocopier and a stapler yeah. and yeah. you know there's this mystique around Ooh, it's I got a book published and yeah it is a kind of a thrill it's a thrill of course but you can get a book published if you have a stapler and and 20 minutes um, and then you can use those materials with your students immediately so uh, you know there, there is no there shouldn't be a bar to entry into producing your own materials and publishing your own books and if you have a story of two in you uh, you know, make little storybooks and and try them out because that's you know that, that's fun and 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 I think that's your creativity only really gets going when you start doing stuff. You actually do it. Yeah. So you sit there going, oh, I'm going to write a really good book that's going to be published one day. You know, just get on and write the thing and read it to people and and see how and and that will prompt the creativity and the the development. Yeah, yeah so it, it definitely builds from that, right? And I never yeah. thought about that. You kind of have to be creative to be creative. It's deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's 1 a.m. It's 1 a.m. my end. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, I, again, I'll, I'll, put a, could... I'll put the link so you can watch the, the uh, Patrick's video because it, it's, it's a great little video and it's very uh, inspirational for, for those that just, you know, if you're an English language teacher, um, you know, produce something uh, and put it out in the world and you never know where it's going to take you. Sure. Yeah. And and especially in, in a world that's uh, 
that's changing so much so quickly. And and I think that there's there's all sorts of ways of producing all sorts of interesting content now that you know really one doesn't have to rely on uh, on external or big uh, you know sort of organisations to, to to make that happen. I mean, having said that, mm -hmm. I do believe that a beautifully designed and well thought out course book is a very, very good basis for any teacher. Um, yeah, and, and uh, with, with, a master with, producer of these types of course books, we just happen to have on the show. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Um, Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's, it's definitely not down <laughs> here. Not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's let's move into that um everybody up here is got to be one of the my most favorite uh, course books teaching from uh, and i've taught so many if i don't know if you've seen any of the, any other of the review videos on team teach china there's quite an extensive list you kind of go through them uh, over the years teaching with young kids but everybody up um uh, especially because i know you've done shine on as well um and tell me if i'm missing anything um, but uh, I loved everybody up. Um, uh, I mean, I'll put a link in my uh, below so you can you know watch the the video of you know more detailed thoughts. Um, but you know the whole design I did like, um, and it's I think you've mentioned it before. But the whole idea of linking the classroom to the the, the, wild, the wider world, um, because mm. a lot of the English language teaching uh, it's just solely about um, teaching English and it kind of kind of they often just kind of muddled together but with uh, everybody up series you know that there, there was more linking to kind of um, what's going on in, in the wider world what's what's happening um, and yeah I just I like the whole format as well and obviously the songs which are just yeah. drilled <laughs> in my head <laughs> forever forever uh, I especially love the um, uh, what is it called? Uh, I don't know the I don't know the titles of the song because I like chicken. chicken. I like this. I, I like this ice cream. cream. What's this? This, this is this is juice. Uh oh, uh oh. I don't. <laughs> Kids always love the uh oh, uh oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a cracker that song. Um, in fact, it, yeah, the songs. The songs really, as you say, they're really, they are very, very catchy. And uh, yeah. yeah, we've had we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun with the songs, especially on the road presenting everybody up because you can you can really get a room of hundreds of teachers. You know, they're so they simple as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I used "Everybody Up." The actual intro song is my warmer for such a long time as well. <laughs> Because you know, even if you don't have anything, it's, it's, they can say that. The, so, so the, the distinct, uh, the, the very distinguished uh, songwriter lineup on Everybody Up. I mean, these are um, we have the Everybody Up song, with the lyrics of which are Everybody Up, 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 Everybody Up, 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 Everybody Up, 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 Everybody Up, Everybody Up. So, so that is written by Julie Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, who is a Grammy winning a Grammy winning songwriter? Who uh, is a New Yorker who also wrote the very beautiful and and poetic song from a distance, mm -hmm. um, which you may know, which was a sort of a, a Grammy winning hit sung by Bette Midler. Um, we also about I think about a third of the songs were written by uh, the Super Simple Songs team. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, uh, as well. Who are absolutely terrific, and they—they, they, I mean, a, again, um, came from a, a a classroom in Tokyo. Um, so they were just teaching kids in Tokyo, and they started making. It was the beginning of YouTube, and they started putting up like little cute little videos on YouTube. Yeah, um, I, I saw their stuff because I mean, I mean, I love their stuff and use it extensively. But th their whole thing was they filled a hole because they were looking for songs and they weren't any simple super simple songs <laughs> that with the, yeah. the text that they could follow along and you know they just it's like going back to being creative they just started doing that and they're huge now yeah yeah 
Well, I mean, I, I was right. doing a talk in, uh, I was doing a Potato Pals talk in, uh, I think it was in, in Osaka, and I was wearing a wig, like a, 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 a Goldilocks wig. I don't know why. I, I was wearing a sort of a, you know, it was like a, I was like a Fraulein. And, and there was this, I was, we were doing some pick, uh, Potato Pals songs, and, and there was this guy in the room who was taller than me, which was quite unusual because you know, I'm six foot three. Oh. And there was this big guy. And I was like, hey, you know, I went over. And I was kind of <laughs> uh, making fun of, I wasn't making fun of him, but I was making fun of the situation where the two of us were, you know, clearly about a foot taller than everyone else in the room. <laughs> and, uh, and that was Devon. So that's Devon Thagard, who uh, he and he was like, I'm just doing this thing with songs, and I just came along to see, you know, see, see what you guys are up to, and uh, yeah, that was Devon. And then so we became friends, and then when everybody up came along, um, I asked him would he be interested in doing songs for everybody up, and he thank goodness because it gave us a great. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a terrific thing to be able to say everybody up has a load of songs written by Super Simple Songs because oh, everybody, yeah. um, not only so are they popular. very good. Everyone knows Super yeah. Simple Songs. And he wrote this song for, for everybody up, which goes like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's great. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> it's inspired. It uh, is. Sorry, Rich, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah, I, well, I was just interested uh, what what were your sort of uh, priorities um, when you were composing everybody up? Like, what were your, uh, I suppose, method, methodological priorities? Um, the, the, I suppose the number one priority and, and strength of everybody up, if I may be so immodest, um, is structure. So unit structure. And it all comes back to to building a really solid unit structure that then you can replicate throughout the series, um, which follows a pattern, which means that the course becomes easy to teach. Mm. So in Everybody Up, um, the first thing we did as, as part of the Everybody Up was very well supported. And we had these amazing teach, uh, author weeks in New York where we'd all get together and get around. And, the first thing we did was we looked at all the other books. Mm. I and mean, literally, we, we locked ourselves in, in rooms with piles and piles of every other primary school book. And then we went through them all and we went through all the words and we went through all the thing. And where do they teach rhinoceros? And where do they teach the present perfect? And where do they do this? And what do they have? And, what? and then there was a survey done of 6,000 teachers. Oh, wow. mm. So we got we got all this information about what people want, what people are doing. Um, and then we looked at big sort of successful courses like Let's Go. And we thought, okay, these, these courses are doing great. What can we do that sort of moves it on to the next, uh, you know, what's the next generation uh, course book going to have um, that incorporates all this, uh, you know, understanding of, of what people need and what people want. And so th then we made a unit structure and then we did some sample units and then we threw them all in the bin and then we made some more and then we tried those out and we looked at those and we thought, mm, wouldn't it be better? And we threw those all in the bin. Mm -hmm. And then we eventually ended up with a unit structure which makes sense, which is kind of, uh, you know, it, it's logical, and yet it's not, I mean, like with all good structures, you don't want to see the structure too much, but you want to know the structures there. And the structure has to help bring the students from learning some words and, if, you know, and also bringing it up to this wider world connection. So in Everybody Up, lesson one, and two are quite traditional, would be very similar in some ways to, you know, they, they have vocabulary, grammar, gram, vocabulary and context. They build the grammar a bit. And then in lesson three, we take that language and do it in a, uh, use it in a story. Uh -huh. <laughs> language in the story is the language they've learned in the first two lessons. And then that's um, sort of... Um, 
uh, supplemented with functional language. So, you know, so you've got the, your story environment, uh, which then goes on into the CLIL lesson, the, the sort of the real world connection lesson. So, you know, you might have a story where they're at the zoo and then the next world, next thing you're in the Serengeti with, you know, cheetahs attacking you. Um, I really like that. It, it, it built mm. and it built logically. And, you know, often you get books and it's just kind of like, okay, now we're doing B. Now we're going pa uh, past simple, present simple, um, but it, it worked well in that, as you said, it was, just, it was like you're building, uh, making a cake or building a house, you know, it's layer upon layer and it kind of, it feels a little bit like magic because you don't really mm. see the structure as much. And I, I, I was very interested to hear that you had all the surveys from all the teachers as well, because I'm like, that makes so much sense because you've, at the very, very beginning, you have the classroom commands like a, one of the very first page or something like that <laughs> and, and and all the books i was always because i always do that on my very first class that's you know uh, teaching classroom commands doing lots of tpr and dances simon says just so that they know what i'm i need them to do <laughs> but yeah it, that integrated into the course book uh, i was like this is such a teacher move where it, was, it makes sense well it's <clears throat> You know, the, the, the course was, we did, we, we had a, a working title course, uh, sorry, a working title for the course, which was New Global Primary. So the idea was we wanted to create, now I, I'm fully aware that everybody has their own classroom context and their own local context and their own cultural teaching context and so on. But we wanted to create a global course. Um, that then everybody in their own place would do their thing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to celebrate that sort of, um, you know, there are tens of millions of English teachers in the world all doing teaching prime. You know, this is a, it, mm -hmm. it is a wonderful thing to, to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful community. And it's, it's, you know, so we did want to create something that was usable anywhere. Um, and, you know, not not just from, oh, we want to sell books anywhere, because actually it's probably easier to sell books if you make them locally uh, relevant. We wanted to do something that was bringing people together all over the world. And the, the, first, uh, the first thing that when the course was launched, we had the Everybody Up Global Sing Along, which was a song contest, which you can, if you go on YouTube and look up Everybody Up Global Sing Along now, you'll see, you know, hundreds of teachers all over the world singing the same song and it was a great thing you know it was really lovely uh, to see so yeah it is it it, it it has that sort of motivation above everything else mm. have they have they done a like a, a mosaic or like a montage of all the people all uh, the teachers singing that because uh, that, I, that I think a great idea there's playlists i think there are playlists of uh, of the global sing-along entries Sounds like another I made, pandemic. I, I made me. something. <laughs> I, I, I made something which was like, yeah, you next thing you're in Thailand, next thing you're, you know, you're singing uh, you know, I like chicken, and then you've got kids. <laughs> I mean, there was one, there was a school in Taiwan and they had the children. There was one poor boy who was covered in ice cream. Uh in the <laughs> it was terrific. <laughs> that, uh, that's gonna get a lot of engagement in the class, I can imagine. <laughs> mm. it, yeah, it's it's actually I I've I have the word engagement on my mind at the moment, Neil, because it seems to me that this is also one of your priorities with the book, Patrick. Uh if I think about, you know, not, first of all, the narrative focus you said was like it's like the third part, right? And, you know, that's very, like, a narrative focus is very engaging for kids. They love stories. Mm. Uh, so you take them into this story world. And also the songs, right? I mean, one of the big things about songs is that kids get into them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So presumably, uh, I mean, how, how would you rate sort of engagement in terms of priority? It's one of the things that I feel sometimes gets undervalued. I think it's everything, isn't it? I, I, I think if... I mean, you know, isn't it the fundamental, if, if children are engaged in what is happening in the classroom, I, 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 if they're not, then, yeah. The, the door's shut, the windows are bolted, bolted, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? The lights are on, but no, no, the lights are yeah. on, nobody's in, you know? Yeah. Something, um, so something that, like that. If only we had some English teachers to <laughs> help us out. <laughs> 
the, the spark of uh, of of engagement yeah and how to to bring that about i mean i i, I would say it's number one yeah 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 i think so yeah and and some, sometimes um you know i think people get lost in kind of you know language objectives and this <clears> sort of thing right and that's when um you know it's it's like you say if the if the kids aren't engaged it's almost what's the point <laughs> yeah and and i think you can you know, if you're not, if you, you can lose a class, yeah. or, or I remember, I, I mean, I remember teaching classes that I'd lost and that feeling of, you know, the, these guys aren't with me, you know, mm. they, they'd rather be somewhere else. Yeah. They, they, they don't want to be here. Um, and the, the mutual feeling in myself that I didn't want to be there either. Uh, and that sort of negative spiral that you can get into with, with a class uh is it, it it's easy to happen uh, and i think yeah maintaining the energy and, and i think that's why wellness uh you know your own wellness and your own um yeah just your own your own spirit uh is so important um when when you're a teacher because you know tiredness or not really wanting to be there or not really knowing why you're there or not really appreciating that you actually have a really cool job and that you are in a very lucky situation. Yeah, that's um, a really important point, I think. Um, and mm. a lot of teachers lose sight of that, especially, yeah. uh, you know, if you're kind of one of those new backpack teachers and you're like, and you move to a place, you kind of realize how lucky you are. I mean, how lucky we are you know, to just happen to win this genetic lottery and be born in a, mm. a native English speaking country that, you know, give us this gift that we're allowed to uh, travel elsewhere. Yeah. And I, th I think it's always important, isn't it, that if ever it feels like, you know, teaching is just becoming a job, um, then maybe you need to mix it up a bit or try something a bit differently or try a different age group of students, but just anything to kind of invigorate yourself a bit because I think. Mm -hmm. You know, when teaching becomes a job and it becomes kind of, you know, automatic and you're just going in and going through the motions, it's not good. <laughs> I think no, that, like any job, yeah, like any, like any, like any job that you'd rather not be doing. I mean, it's very, it is very damaging to the soul. Yeah. I think that's um, one of the things that, um, like, moving on a little bit, I guess, from everybody up in, in the course books. Uh, and moving on to picker pals, uh, that kind of it kind of makes sense with your journey because you're changing it up and you're taking the classroom. You've, you're kind of moving away from the classroom to the wilder world and kind of bringing the wilder world to the classroom. Um, you know, could we have you start talk a little bit about that? And um, um, yes, sure. Um, I love being outside uh, I, I love the outdoors i love walking outdoors and i moved back to ireland uh 12 years ago now and about five or six years ago i started I, oh, well i was walking where i walk every morning after i dropped the kids at school and i found this seagull flapping around on on the pier and it was all caught up in fishing line and there was this sort of semi-comic situation with me and my West Highland Terrier and and the fishing line and asking old men for scissors and you know <laughs> eventually we got we had to bring it into the local restaurant actually for the chef to free this thing to <laughs> cut off it. Uh, yeah and then there was this beautiful moment where where the bird was you know released into the sky and just before it was let go it pecked me very badly on my on my finger and there was blood and you know so it was a kind of shocking you know 20 minutes uh, and um the next morning i went to the same place and there was a litter picker like a picker upper on the ground oh, okay. and um be, being a, a thieving you know whatnot i <laughs> just thought oh well look a picker upper and some council guy had left it obviously so i picked up the picker upper and i started litter picking as as just a thing you know and i, and I got really into it and i you know it is at a certain age, you know, you develop these obsessions. Uh, so every morning I would go down and with my West Highland Terrier and I would pick up the litter that is all over the coast. Uh, and 
then I'd start finding, you know, most of it's awful rubbish, but every so often you find something really interesting. You know, you find something like, you know, a pair of false teeth or, a, you know, a, a message in a bottle or, you know, you find you do. You, if you be if you're a beachcomber, you do actually find really funny and interesting things. So um, I yeah. So I started a collection, much to my wife's disgust, um, <laughs> which, um, which which was of all these weird things like dolls heads and, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> bit, bits of seagull bone and sort of, and then I, I, I'm involved as, as a governor of the local school here. So I went, I thought, okay, well, I'll show this stuff to some of the kids down there. Obviously, my, my desire to teach was overwhelming. So I started arriving at the school with suitcases full of this stuff. <laughs> And I just the kids were just went mad for it. They were, they loved it. You know, they just they, they, they just it was just a different sort of uh, you know f fantastic uh, energy in the classroom. So then I thought, okay. Um, then oh, then it was my my niece's twenty first birthday party, and it was a fancy dress party. And and so I thought, oh, okay, I'll go as 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 some sort of weirdo. Uh, shamanistic kind of you know uh, guy and so I got a curtain and I attached some of these beach finds uh, to a uh, to, to this curtain and I wore it and it was like, a, like this cape and it was a hit you know everyone was like oh that's really cool you know <laughs> it's like, well, it's, well, I'll, I'll, put a, I'll put a, a, an image up so people can see this this blanket um, of uh, collect pick so things cloak, I, I actually have it here because I, I knew you Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. No. Um, wow. That looks like it took a long time. <laughs> There's hundreds of pieces on it. It took forever, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and he so makes, then, I love the noise as well. <laughs> So now when I go into the, the, you know, the kids, they're like, you know, they really find it quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. Forgive the, the rattling. So this sort of grew legs, as, as is that what you say? The, the, yeah, the, yeah, the cloak, uh, the cloak grew legs. And then, I don't know, I was thinking about where, you know, I was thinking about, you know, I've had a sort of a strange life with lots of different aspects to it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, okay, I've done this, and I've done, the, you know, these things. And I thought, well, what's in the middle there? What's, what is the thing that will, you know, make, you know, all that I can actually, you know, have some fun with the things I, I've, I've done so far. And so I came up with an idea to create, oh, I mean, I thought, I'll write some book. I, I'm a children's book writer, I'll write some books about litter picking. Mm -hmm. So my passion is for litter picking, I'm a writer, let's write, so I wrote these books, or at least I created some characters called the Picker Pals characters, and they, uh, yeah, so they're a completely random selection of, <laughs> oh, I'll have an aardvark, oh, a sloth, yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, yeah, we need it. So the, these are the picker pals, and um, and again, yeah, self-publishing in action. So there's, you know, these are characters that go on litter picking adventures and get into all sorts of scrapes. Mm. But, um, and yeah, so but uh, books and classroom stuff is one thing, but you've got to actually get the kids doing something. Yeah. So then I thought we need a pack um, which contains litter picking stuff. So I designed a, a bag which contains all the stuff you need for litter picking. Mm -hmm. So it has gloves and high vis and all the kit and everything. And it's made from recycled sales. And so the, then the kid, the, the schools become picker pal schools and they get all their books and worksheets and all the environmental classroom content but they also get their pick a pack and then they can go out litter picking in turn so they take it in turns mm -hmm. so it's like a, a sort of a used you know that classroom teddy thing yeah 
Yeah, it's like a useful version of that. <laughs> like, I, I, I just see so many possibilities with it as well. You know, like the, the kids, they go and they, they pick uh, the uh, trash or they pick the litter or whatever. And then, you know, maybe they find something interesting and then you set them to write a story. Well, what, where, did you, where, where do you think this came from and stuff like that? Yeah. And then it's, well, it's personalized. There's, there's so much learning in it. I mean, there's, 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 I mean, for me, I mean, and again, I don't want to come across as a complete lunatic, but it's everything for me because it combines, it combines everything. It's got environmental, it's got science, it's got... Um, story storytelling because they're going on a litter picking adventure. It's cross generational. Uh, they just love having a job. It gives them a, a responsibility. It gives them stewardship of their local environment. It connects the school and the classroom to the local, in uh, to the local, you know, the, the community. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes it, it. I mean, and it works. And you know, people, the teachers love it. Uh, and the kids, the kids. Get, I mean, the highlight of my whole life, probably actually, was uh, I was in West Dublin and showed. I, I took out the. I, I I do a kind of a spiel, yeah. and I take out the picker pack. It's like the the highlight of the thing is taking out the picker pack. And I took out the picker and I said, and look, and in there we have. A big litter picker for the for the um, a big picker upper for the grown ups and a little picker up for for you guys and one little boy he put his hands up and he said, "I'm in heaven." <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, because you know, with kids, you know, my my son he spent about three years wearing a Bob the Builder helmet and high vis. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they love a job. You know, and yeah. and. You're getting a job and you're getting the tools and you're getting a lot of you know you're you're getting a lot of feedback and you're leading this this change in your um in your area so it's it's i'm very pleased with it and now we're in i think we're in a hundred schools in in ireland now so the next thing is the world yeah yeah definitely <laughs> yeah i can see it being you know like everybody up in it being a, a global thing definitely um I think it's, and it's one of those things with kids as well, where it's, you know, one of those things that they're not told, they're told not to do. You don't pick up trash, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. then it's kind of, it's a little bit taboo, but you're like, oh, I can do this. And then this is actually yeah. interesting. I, yeah, I see a lot of uh, potential and learning potential with that with classrooms because it leads into so many different things with sciences and, yeah. uh, and such. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and it's free labor. It's like, uh, like prison labor. <laughs> <laughs> that is the thing that must not be said, Neil. <laughs> no, sorry. I'll cut, I'll cut that out. I'll cut that out. We'll clap. <laughs> so we local, make our point. <laughs> yeah, local getting children to pick up their rubbish. But it, it, isn't that a parent's dream anyway, just to uh, you know, get your kids to be uh, doing jobs for you? <laughs> well, it, it's a kid's dream to be leading. Yeah, and it's you know, or, you know, if you think of all the great children's stories, it's where the children take over con control of the situation, and the children are leading the grown-ups, and that's what Pick a Pals is. It's the children come. So, obviously, the parents know that this is going to happen because you've got sort of letters telling the parents what's going on. But the the child will come home and say, "I've got the pick a pack this weekend," and. They, you know, the competition to get the picker pack, you know, they have to have sort of the, the picker pack is kept under armed guard in the classroom because everybody wants to take it home so much. So you're building <laughs> this, uh, you know, and the, you're giving them power. That's what I mean. That, and I suppose that's what tools are. You know, the tools give us power mm. and, and you're giving the children the tools and the equipment to yeah. and then they take the they, they take the grown ups out. And there's that, and there's that, that agency. They, yeah. Um, can you can you give yeah. us some details on how schools and teachers can you know uh, get more more information on Pick a Pal? Um, yes, we have a website which I will um, I'll send you the link to, and um, it's as I say, it's we're we're, we're launching worldwide um, in the near future. So I what I'm interested to to do is have conversations with people so yesterday i was talking to a teacher in italy um where 
there is some litter. Uh, and um, talking about the cultural sort of aspects and, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, it's almost a political thing. She was saying, you know, that some people who are environmentally minded and some people who wouldn't, wouldn't touch it, you know, um, but that certain clubs would do it or certain groups would, would do it. And, you know, so that there are all sorts of interesting conversations to be had. I mean, I know Brighton, uh, I'm looking forward to finding somebody in Brighton uh, who might be able to, you know, put me in touch with some good people over there. I don't know if anybody knows anybody. Well, uh, not 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 so much yet, to be honest, apart from myself. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, That's all, what it's I was because, thinking of, really. because of the because of the current situation. Who knows? You know, who knows when Brighton's going to open up again properly in mm. terms of teaching? Yeah, no, there's definitely different uh, cultural aspects to uh, or cultural ideas on litter, isn't there? Um, I think uh, it's probably a bit more. Um, like you know, we we're very, we're quite aware of it uh, in sort of uh, the British Isles or Northern Europe in general, right? Um, but uh, I remember when I was living in Spain, I was walking behind a guy uh, in Valencia. <clears throat> the guy took out a cigarette, he was like lights it, and he had his his like his fag packet in one hand. He just tossed it over his shoulder, <laughs> like and I was walking behind him. Like the thing almost hit me, you know. I mean that that was you know that's the kind of thing that you can see sometimes. Uh, maybe that attitude is starting to change a bit more now, uh, but yeah. And I think it's that's why I, I'm happy to be involved at the age I, you know the the age of children were were involved with. It's a, it's an it's a fantastic age to be creating uh, a positive you know teaching around this kind of stuff because mm. you're really you know I, I i think something happens um between you know the you know little kids get this they really do they get the if you know they get the impact on the environment they get that it's not nice they get that it's that it's bad behavior they get that mm. you know and so when you give them the opportunity to actually make a difference themselves i think you know you i mean we on the brochure of pickup as we say you know creating young environmentalists mm -hmm. so it's not it's not it's not about picking up litter it's about creating a mindset that is empowering people to think of themselves in a different way regarding the environment um so yeah that's the plan yeah i i think it's it's fantastic and i, I will be putting up links below here so um, people can go and you know get more information and uh, you know bring that into their schools so uh, one thing that's on my mind Patrick I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on the future of uh, teaching young learners can you can you do you have any foresight into where things might be going in say 20 30 years Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a simple question, right? <laughs> um, yeah, can I, yeah, tw 20, uh, 20 minutes? Is <laughs> 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 I'm going to finish this cup of coffee, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to go and walk, walk the dog. Um, I, there are clearly things that are, that are emerging uh, and, and, obviously the expectation for interactive exciting uh, content that is you know things are moving fast in that direction that things are becoming much more uh, you know teachers are expecting much more uh, students need much more in order to to be engaged i would i would imagine that there will be some incredibly cool uh, sort of gamified uh, learning environments, uh, AR, VR, sort of mixed reality. You know, I, I think the future of language learning is going to be dramatically different. Um, the, I think we'll look, in a few years, we'll look at the classroom, take out your book, turn to page 17 kind of vibe as, yeah, even now it's kind of getting a bit dated, but I think that's going to be, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, there will be storytelling and content and songs and music and dance, but the, the delivery is going to be different. There's going to be these, the, I mean, the links to the wider world, actually, you know, the, the everybody up sort of let's link the classroom to the wider world. 
will be complete reality. I think and, that's and, why it's it's that's why I I kind of bring that up um, because I think going forward uh, for me when I when I look into the future with teaching young learners I see uh, more more connection outside of the classroom not yeah. not less so when when I heard you were doing pick a pal so I was like moving forward I see this is you know going forward this has been a fantastic avenue um, you know with schools you know been a huge component of that well the, the technology the, the language for communication you know that, that communication will be a, a very i mean even now it's easy enough but it'll become more and more easy uh to to have either curated or your more completely real um interaction between people you know classrooms will be connected in much more interesting ways uh, teachers will be supported in much more interesting ways and will be connected in, you know, I mean, I think everything, it, it's, it's, it's happening, you know, it, it really is happening. And, and I think the, the gap between the home and the classroom will vanish. Uh, so, you know, the, the learning will take place sort of seamlessly. Uh, and I think teachers will need to be People have been saying this forever, but teachers really will need to be, uh, you know, up to speed with this stuff. Uh, you know, they'll need to be open to exciting new sort of technologies. But actually, even if they're not open to them, they're going to be using them anyway, actually. So well, think, that's what we're finding out right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, for sure. Yeah, look at us. Yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah. It's kind of like someone's put some extra tokens into the the game machine, and they've just turned it onto turbo mode, and then, yeah. okay, all that thing that you think is going to be happening 20, 30 years down the line, now nope, it's happening right now. You're not prepared. Oh, sorry. But it's. I, I think the the you know last night I was up half the night. I was up half the night make, making a cardboard box. You know, so you know this. This was my, you know, and I was there at one thirty in the morning, and I was, it was Prit and scissors, you know, the Prit stick and the scissors and ripping up loads of bits of paper and, and that sort of activity though I think, you know, that's really the that you know that's that's what kids love, mm -hmm. um, you know that that it's it's touching, you know, do it's doing. It's touching things, it's making things, it's sticky, you know, it's, it's that sort of activity that, so there's going to be all this cool stuff, te te techie cool stuff, and there's going to be a sort of an understanding that actually, you know, real stuff is things, but then when those come together, there's an awful lot of real magic can, can, can happen because you can, you know, you can send your Prit stick by, you know, uh, through a zoom call you know you can uh, <laughs> there your print stick uh, with somebody in in cairo and then pass it but you know the the sharing of real world experience mm -hmm. so so it, it's the real world stuff that matters yeah i don't but think the, yeah, you, the, you shouldn't worry so much about the the technology aspect of it because the real world will always trump the the glitz of that you know you can have the most gamified you know powerpoint mm. presentation yeah. with all the avengers and disney mm. characters yeah. out there but you know if you just bring in a a, a doll head that you yeah. found on the beach yeah. they'd be like what is the story behind this i think yeah. that's probably going to be something that the kids are going to want to engage with more I, yeah, I, I think actually that's probably one of the big challenges that um, kind of ELTs had with technology is actually using it in a, in a useful way, isn't it? You know, and I think uh, because, I mean, a lot of technology has been around for a long time now, you know, tablets and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I remember when me and you first started teaching, Neil, yeah. you know, I don't think a lot of classrooms really had any idea what they were doing with it. You know, it was just like, oh, we'll just have the tablet there for the sake of having it there, mm -hmm. you know, and on that will work on its own. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think it's taken a long time really for, um, you know, teachers to really, uh, to basically know how to use the tools well, I guess. 
uh, and for different kinds of software to come along, you know. Which and to realise it is just a tool as well. It's not just, it, this is not the thing to teach the students. This is not like the, the magic bullet. It's just another, mm. you know, thing that you can pull from your teaching toolbox. The, mm -hmm. the, I, the, the sole idea of engagement and getting, you know, your students, your kids, you know, involved in the classroom and excited to be there, it, mm. it doesn't change. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I remember at, at secondary school, one of the teachers came in and he held up a, a silver spoon, a ladle, like an old soup ladle. And he said, um, look at this. And we were down the back going, like, uh, he's gone nuts. Um, and he was holding up this 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 ladle. And, and he was like, no, no, look. And uh, yes, Jackson, behave yourself. Um, yeah, no, look. And, and he showed us this silver ladle. And it was it was a beautiful ladle. And it, he showed us the silver mark on the back. And he said, this is how you can tell the age of it. And this is where you can tell where it was made. And then he got really into it, told us about it was in his grandmother's house and it had been in her grandmother's house. And actually, it was Georgian. And then da 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 and Georgian. Da, da, da. And, so he, you know, he he brought this thing and then he passed it round and we all sort of, you know, waved it or hit each other with it or, you know, and I can remember that ladle, and, you know, and it was it was forty years ago, and I can't even remember the teacher. <laughs> I can't even. I, I, who was he? I have no idea. I can't remember at all. I can't even. I presume it was history, but I, I don't even remember that. But the, the the real object, I think, has has much much more power than any uh digital thing i mean it's a real thing you know it's it's there there and it's it's you know any sort of beautifully presented video of a silver spoon you know a documentary about imagine going in and saying okay kids we're going to show you a documentary today about a georgian silver spoon <laughs> No, yeah, please. Can we run? Can we get out of here now? So. But on the counter to that, if you write it down on paper and you give this to another teacher, be like, okay, here's a silver spoon, and this is my lesson plan for the silver spoon. They probably they might think you're out of your mind, but what but they no, don't the realize is that the, the whole story, the atmosphere, and how you kind of present it, and you know how it's something important to you. That's it. Yeah, move, you know, transfers to them, and that's why yeah. it's important. Yeah, it's, it's passion. It's passion yeah. for something. Um, it's it's passion for something real that that does so many things. It works on so many levels, and it gives the teacher. Okay, sorry, I forgot who it was now, but you know, at that time, it, it was he was conveying his passion for a real thing. So when I go into a classroom with the cloak. Okay, it's conveying the idea that here's a lunatic um, who's somehow being let into our classroom. Um, can we? Somebody call the police. Uh, but they'll remember, you know, they won't remember my head, but they'll remember the cloak. Yeah. Uh, you, you've created your own silver spoon moment. But, but it is that. It, it's, it's about bringing your stuff to your classroom, bringing your thing. Don't just be like, don't be everybody up unit three. Be <laughs> you and do everybody up unit three, uh, but do it and bring yourself to it. So if, again, if it's a, you, you know, you should be bringing, it's it's just a structure. A course is just a, it's just a structure. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's just for you to dance on top of it. You know, it's for you to, to, I don't mean to stomp on top of it, okay? <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's a starting point. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that would, uh, I totally agree. And I, I think that's a, a great uh, end to the interview. <laughs> I, I know, you know, time's marching on. Um, but uh, Rich, do you have any final thoughts, words? Mm, no, very interesting though. Um, yeah, I love all this discussion about Realia. Um, the cape is amazing because I, I, I actually haven't used your stuff before in uh, in classroom, Patrick. Unfortunately, uh, Lucky man. so uh, <laughs> so I wasn't that familiar with it. But um, no, no, it's uh, it's uh, absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the the cape is incredible. Like um, I can imagine that. Um, you know the, the the idea that all these different things could have a different story or a different you know there's just there's so much uh, potential for creativity and whatnot uh with that so yeah fantastic uh, i don't really have any final 
kind of questions or anything. Okay, okay. Um, then I'm going to uh, give it back to Patrick uh, to give his final thoughts, uh, any final comments that you want to leave with us, any links or anything like that. Uh, but before I do so, thank you very much for coming on our show. Uh, it's been a fun, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, and hopefully at some point, if you ever have time, I'd love to do it again. Um, but over to you, Patrick. Well, thank you. I've, I've very much enjoyed it as well. And uh, it's very nice to meet you guys. And I'm sure uh, in, a, in another world, we'll, we'll meet up uh, once we get rid of this uh, wretched thing. Um, and uh, yeah, final, a final thought would be um, to, 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 to start um, and to bring, you know, to bring, you don't think, am I a sort of creative person or am I X, Y, or Z or whatever, just start and let that take you on whatever journey it takes you on, because that's when the fun starts. That's when, you know, that's when the, the, the magic happens. Uh, is is when you just start and and do it and don't particularly wonder too much about where you're going, uh, but because you'll be going on a, a fun adventure and yeah well thank it's it's lovely to be able to talk to you and uh, uh, if anybody's listening out there yeah uh, thank you enjoy your uh, journey uh, wonderful excellent call to action uh, as they say um, so if you're wanting to have some see some of uh, more of my stuff, um, remember to check out teamtochina.com where we've got all our PowerPoint lessons and, and all our gamification and Team Teacher China on the YouTube uh, for more teaching stuff, Team Teacher Baby for more of our parenting stuff and Team Teacher English for some other uh, homeschool English uh, lessons. And then we have Mr. Rich. You should have come to less profits already. <laughs> um, if there's any students who happen to be watching this, because that's what that channel's for, and I haven't done a video in a while either, I need to do something like that. And um, for Patrick Jackson and everybody up and uh, Potato Pals and Picker Pals, all that, I'm going to put links uh, in the description box and in the comments. So we highly encourage that you get yourself over there and, uh, as Patrick say, just get started. <laughs>